Welcome back to Transformers Chronicles. I'm Delvin, a.k.a. The Dark Web. And in case you're new to the show, welcome. And let me tell you what this thing is all about. We're going for a wild, crazy ride, chronicling an awesome, wacky, and yes, sometimes corny world of Marvel Comics, the Transformers. But I will never be going at it alone. Let's meet my chronicling companions. First up is the founder of the Longbox Crusade, relative novice to the Transformers world, the seeker of the matrix of knowledge. His name is Pat Sampson, sometimes known as DJ Crisados. Hello, Pat. Hello, Delvin. Hello. Yeah, I, I think I'm. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm. I'm somewhat of a novice now. I think I'm doing all right. But I tell you, our last episode, man, my head is exploded. Mm, yes. Yeah. That, I mean, hopefully you're able to get yourself back together somewhat, standing up straight, not bent over, fold up, and oh head or possibly a weapon yeah yeah I, I, I hopefully yeah. not i think i'm just the guy that just kind of stands there and the people put their heads in me uh well okay never mind without my head i don't think right you know, see I, I figured the best thing for that was just absolute utter silence you know i didn't i had nothing for that but silence and we're going to transition on to our transformers expert the lesser half of merit watching cartoons and the rod pod the provider of knowledge jonathan schaefer Haynes. hello there gentlemen. hello delvin i'm going to come across as a bad transformers expert in that uh i still don't quite know exactly how the headmasters work do they just pilot them are they merged together as one being i mean what happened to the heads that got taken off and just kind of left there they speak on a shelf now they're like yeah on the shelf. so are they still there on the shelf on nebulos like forever oh that's a good question <laughs> Now you can see, now my head's going to explode it's again. This is more of that existential horror, like Spanner yeah. becoming the bridge, the space I mean, bridge. In right, the, let's... the Decepticons, Zarak and Scorponok kind of merged together to become one being. There was that horror going on. But meanwhile, the Autobots are just like, well, I guess you're part of the tour now. Bye. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Where I mean, are they just set in an exhibit? Surely they depowered those heads and the new head. We're, we're talking a lot about. Yeah, we're talking a lot about heads right now. It's it's weird, and <laughs> I, I I don't like it. And since I don't like it, let's go to someone I do like. Actually, I do like <laughs> the greater half of married watching cartoons and the rock. Her name is Maggie Schaefer. Hello, Maggie. Hello, Delvin. How's it going? It's going okay. How are you? Good. Doing all right. Doing all right. Since Although, I, I'll go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, because usually we do like, the, has anything changed or is new in your life? And I was thinking, because like nothing really is. But then it occurred to me, I will never be the same after having covered those Headmaster stories. So <laughs> there's it, that. It, yep. seems, <laughs> it seems as if the Headmaster series has shocked and awed <laughs> most of the Transformers Chronicles. Uh, I am shook. Panel. I, I it was shook. it was so so much of a thing. She had to briefly downgrade it to being the the um, greater third of the Rod Pod, <laughs> yeah, as John M. Wilson had to come and um, talk about the cartoons and show us that it gets even weirder. Yeah, it just doesn't stop. Mm, nope. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those where it probably seemed like a good idea, and it's like it's one of those where it's best that you don't think about it because I didn't. I did not think about you know the literal body dysmorphia that would have to occur in order to like fold up and become someone's head, and it's like how long can you do that indefinitely? Not indefinitely. I don't know, and maybe it wasn't meant to know. Maybe maybe our not cynical adult eyes can pick that up uh you know uh, i felt like i've had a lot of practice doing that back in the day when i was in school and they had like tornado warnings <laughs> and we had to go into the hallways or the bathrooms and you know do they get do that tornado position. warnings anymore like you you've got kiddos pat did, did they have to do tornado think, drills yeah yeah they do but i don't know if they make them go into a like a place and then get in that position i remember that yeah like they if i got if I got in that crouch position now, I might not be able to get back up. Yeah, I, mean, I, know. 
basically <laughs> put your put your head between your legs to kiss your butt but, goodbye because yeah. the tornado. So that, okay, that brings up well that we're going to go off on this whole thing. But <laughs> Zerok, he's a pretty old guy. So look, I mean, go I, I get, I guess you know whatever cybernetic enhancements that they had increased flexibility. I don't know. Uh, maybe they got I some good you were gonna, heads on. I thought you were going to go with the, I mean, if there were like a tornado, like about to like, you know, plunge down on this school, but does the tornado see all the kids just huddle like that? It's like, oh, they're doing what they're supposed to. Never mind. And then hop over and like hit the nearby trailer park, perhaps. (laughs) Well, all of these questions will not be answered at any other format at any other point in time. (laughs) So I just... I know. I, I, this is. I've this, disappointed the audience. No, I know. I understand. This show is really more than meets the eye. It is more than meets the eye. Oh, the tornado. I see what you're saying there. I got it. I'm not even looking at you, Pat, but I picked up what you were doing there. I got it. That's, that's called rapport, ladies and gentlemen. The purpose of this podcast will be tackling all of Marvel's Transformers comic books in order, starting with issue one and working our way to the series end at issue 80. We will answer any questions that are brought up to the best of our ability and see how these books we loved then as a kid hold up to our eyes as an adult now. This podcast is guaranteed to be, you guessed it, more than meets the eye. So everyone, let's talk about fake outs and spaceships right after this break. Oh, an eye like the eye of a storm. Yes. <laughs> I guess that joke that Pat made earlier. Yes, yes. I, I can't I just slip like, anything past me. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking it as a joke. It just came out that way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that part out. That's a, that's the a sign of a clever mind, Pat. The Transformers will return after these messages. New Warriors, come out to play. Come out to play, a New Warriors podcast is streamed live in front of an internet audience. You can join in on the live stream and chat every second Tuesday of the month on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search for and follow Longbox Crusade. Transformers. Welcome back. The issue we'll be covering today is Transformers issue 35, and here is John with the cover description. Grimlock peeks out of the corner box. The Marvel logo and the More Than Meets the Eye logo are black. The Transformers logo is green with yellow trim. The action itself shows a striking scene of the combined Combatagon Gestalt Bruticus swinging an entire damn train like a giant set of nunchucks and hitting the combined Protector Bot's Defensor right in the face. Tiny humans scatter in the lower right among other trains still on tracks. Another striking choice is the decision to color Bruticus in solid blue and Defensor in solid red and the rest of it in yellow. And that is this cover what do you think about that cover john well let's see this is an adventure in primary colors isn't it (laughs) red blue and yellow the magical three colors that when combined can form any color or can just make the entire robot red and another entire robot blue and everything else yellow which and I know I, I rip on Nelly Amtov all the time. Most of the time, you know, it doesn't really detract from it. I will say in this case, this detracts from it for me. On the other hand, I don't really know when this was being done in conjunction with the Headmasters series, with which Nell had to do double duty on. So it's quite likely that this wound up being a rush job because of being overworked. I'm going to go ahead and assume that's the case and and try not to hold against it. But the action itself on this is pretty dang cool. It's Defensor and Bruticus fighting. 
it and um, swinging an entire train, not just a locomotive, just the whole train, swinging it around like a whip, basically, and hitting him in the face. And uh, the um, the scale differential that's shown with the little kids and the robots is amazing. I like the different angles. It's it's pretty slick. It's just the the coloring issues really, really do distract. Like it, you have to look really close at it to figure out which of these robots is which. That's me on that one. Pass it to Maggie. Uh, yeah, I I agree. I really like this cover. I think the action is great. The kapow into Defensor's face with the entire flipping train is great. And I love the scale from like the train tracks and the little people in the foreground. And it really is like just this close to ruined by the block coloring on Bruticus and Defensor. Not a fan of that, especially considering all the rest of the detail, like on the train and on the transformers and on the ground. But this, like the two biggest important like objects in your cover are not colored correctly. And that bothers me. It does, however, depict something that happens in the book. So that's a plus. I will give it that. But otherwise, yeah, I, I, I agree with what John said. It, it does bother me, and it does almost ruin it, but it's a very cool cover. Pat, what do you think? I'm going to agree with the action on this. It really is striking uh, with the action that's being depicted. And again, with John and Maggie, if this thing was colored to f- so you knew what robot was which, I think this thing would really pop and just really draw me in more. And when I first looked at it before I started reading, I didn't know who it, they were until reading it. Now I understand. And it really doesn't help with the block coloring, just the simple coloring that's on this one. With all the detail that's in here, to see it colored nice, man, this thing would really stand out. It's interesting. Uh, in this case, I actually like it being colored the way it is. I don't I don't take anything away from Nell Yomtov for coloring it the way he did. And if you look closely enough, you'll see that Bruticus, the just out on the right, there's a Decepticon symbol. You see, that's the bad guy. And if you look at the bottom lower left, Defensor, there's an Autobot symbol there. If you were questioning who the heck these people were, and maybe you may not know that one is Defensor and one is Bruticus, but you can know that one is an Autobot and one is a Decepticon. And usually, like even in the cartoons, when you know you have the da na 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 na, you'll see the Autobot symbol in red. You see the Decepticon symbol in a blue purplish. So I actually have no problem whatsoever with the coloring being the way it is, and I absolutely love the action. So when you take the let's just assume about sixty foot giant robots fighting each other, and one's hitting the other one with a train. And by the way, if you hit someone with a train, that might be a loco motive. <laughs> See, that's a, that's a train joke, John. It's it was. Dallin, it, Dallin, Dallin, we, don't try to derail us now. Just, it's, sorry, it's sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we get this right. enough with Wilson. The train puns begin. <laughs> toot, sorry. Toot. <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right. Yes, but, but I mean, good grief. The first thing it is crazy. Like Bruticus hits Defensor with a. Mother freaking train. Like, oh it's my goodness. Pretty yeah. great. That's awesome. So, yeah, that plus, I mean, so that in relation to the kids, the rest of the train, I do like the drawing of it. And I am the only one, it seems, that does not mind the coloring being the way it was. Rock'em um, Sock'em robots. They do look like Rock'em Sock'em yeah, robots. That's what I thought. Well, I mean, in a way, they are Rock'em Sock'em robots, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, no, somebody should have seen this cover and made Rock'em Sock'em robots the movie. <laughs> I think, I mean, I'd go see this if one Rock'em Sock'em robot picks up a train and swings it at the other. They'll kill you off know, I, I, I want to say that they would never do that, but I'm not going to say that because uh, I was they I'm made sitting, battleship for God's sake. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I w- I'll be sitting in a the theater two years from now and then seeing the setup and I'm like, <laughs> no, no. Mm. Anyway, all Your right. phone lights up. Did you see this? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I John. didn't do it. <laughs> You have heard our thoughts. Let's rate the thing. If you don't know here on Transformers Chronicles, we do a one to 10 scale like tech specs on the original toys. One at the low end, 10 at the high end. We'll go with Pat to give us the first rating for this issue. All right. Wow. I am going to set the baseline here. So I'm going to give it a six. 
Mm. Mm. And it's the coloring that brings it down for me. The lines and all that, perfectly drawn. I just think, again, if this thing was colored to their matching uh, colors at each Decepticon or Bruticus and Protecticonus or whatever his name is. Defensor. Defensor, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they got some, they're the Protecticons and they turn into this Defensor and then it's like, why don't you just call yourself Thor <laughs> or something like that? You, you, all these names and I got the headmaster stuff going on. I'm yeah, cool. There was like 54 sure. new characters in the headmasters thing too. You can't but, keep them straight. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but anyway, I'm I'm going with a six. I, I would bump it up more, but the coloring. All right, Pat, the water's cold. Let's see if Maggie's going to warm it up. <laughs> well, I'm going to give it an added point for depicting something that happens in the book. I, I've just decided to claim that as like my thing. Uh, so I, I'm going to give it a seven. I was really on the fence. I wasn't quite sure. Um, but I, I'll go ahead and give it, I'll give it a seven. I feel comfortable with that decision. Warming up. What are you going to do, John? Is it coming? It getting warmer? <laughs> uh, you know, and it's looking at it again, you know, and I, I, I stand by my ripping on, on the various things, but I do like, <laughs> I always again. stand by everything. I, <laughs> I stand by my blatant blind criticism that isn't well <laughs> thought out. Um, I do like the uh, use of the yellow on the train itself. For the most part, mm-hmm. it, it, some cool stuff nice there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to give this an eight in the interest of heating things up. And <laughs> it does get a decrease because of the color situation. But this could have been a 10 for me oh, if easily. this was if this was colored it would have been an 11. Um, properly. And not not just that, if there had been like a background, you know, the background color or something like that and just printed in. Honestly, legitimately didn't notice that there wasn't actually much of a background until you just pointed that out. <laughs> Maybe it's just overcast. That's how it is. It's just an overcast day. <laughs> but I will give it an eight because it, the cover is that good. How about you, Delvin? Man, I'll finish warming us up. I'll give it a nine. I like All right. it. Hey. We Ooh, we got out there moved up. That's right. I like the cover. <laughs> I think it's I think it's really good. There's not many times recently even in, every now and again in the book they will take one of the big combiners the just alts and you get that full articulation which mm-hmm. i can i can understand that you might not want to do that in a book because heck you know you got 20 something other pages to draw and you don't want to spend all this time drawing a super articulate robot that's usually like five or six robots combined into one i get that but frank springer did a really good job on this cover and it drew me in, and it, I think is a pretty good welcome back after covering uh, the Man of Iron series, uh, like we did um, a couple of episodes ago. I like this. This is a welcome back to me, so I give it a nine. And with that, here's Pat with the credits for the issue. Well, Dylan, I'm glad you asked. Transformers number thirty-five. Its on sale date was September fifteenth, nineteen eighty-seven. Its cover date was December 1987. Got a cover price of $1. Story was by Bob Budiansky. Pencils, Don Perlin. Inks, Ian Aiken and Brian Garvey. Colors go to Neil Yamtov. Letters is Jack Morelli. Editor is Don Daly. And the cover credits go to Frank Springer. All this is brought to you by Mike's Amazing World and TFWiki.net. Back to you, Delvin. Yes, sir. Let's get to the synopsis. It is a world transformed where things are not what they seem. It is the world of the Transformers. The Transformers, more than meets the eye. From Marvel Comics. The title of this issue was Child's Play. So Jed, Sammy, Alan, Robin, and Daisy, that's Robin's teddy bear, are all playing at a Northern Californian train yard. Space Wars! Pew pew! Oh, and those Space Wars serve as an allegory for what's about to happen as we catch up to the goings on of the Protector Box, charged with bringing the imprisoned blaster, rendered useless by means of a device that renders him unable to transform or do much of anything, back to the Ark for trial. That was a very long sentence. My English teachers would not approve. Anyway, back in 32, if you recall, the Protectobots beat the crap out of the Combaticons, and the Combaticons want revenge, so they followed the Protectobots to, you guessed it, that Northern California train yard. 
The fight is on, and much to anyone's surprise, the Jestar Combaticon Bruticus actually wins the fight with the Protectabot's Jestar Defensor. Odor rules! Not quite. Once again, Blaster is the ace in the hole. As he was placed in a drainage pipe nearby as a non-combatant, the kids found him, removed the device, and Blaster found an ingenious way to take down the much larger Bruticus. As a result of the kids playing a key part in the battle, Blaster decides to take them on a literal space journey inside of Blastoff, rendered inert by the same device that Blaster had. And that brings us to the other part of the story. While Grimlock may not be the best leader in the world, he has successfully gotten the arc repaired, fueled up, and guess who he's still mad at and is now pursuing? Let's talk about the book. <laughs> On Transformers Chronicles, we take turns bringing up something from the comics, starting with but not limited to goods and bads that everyone discusses. John, what do you got, man? I'm going to start the ball rolling by giving a kudos to Bob Budiansky's uh, writing skills in pulling off something that is pretty difficult to do in comic books, which is make kids not irritating. These kids are interesting, and they're not annoying. At least I didn't find them that way. And a lot of times, a lot of writers um, just don't quite seem to get kids. These kids seem to act like kids, and particularly 1980s kids, who it was not at all unre it was not at all unrealistic to find uh, kids wandering a train yard in Northern California in the mid in the mid to late 80s. I imagine parents just liked having the kids out of their hair. So I'll give it to Bob. Awesome. We can pass that or oh no. Let's let's just pass. We don't we can we can continue to talk about this or any other thing. Uh Pat, what do you got? You can add on to John's or you can go completely in a direction on your own. Your choice, sir. Well, he does say that they're the weakest of the planet's natives, the children. I mean they are. But I kinda under I kinda understand. I mean that, but an eight year old steps to me, I'm kicking his butt. Like, whack, whack. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Do you hear that, eight-year-olds? Stay away That's from right. <laughs> the Eight-year-old challenge out. right here, man. <laughs> You're like that Seinfeld when Kramer goes he to the track. Track. <laughs> <laughs> And he's fighting the kids. And <laughs> oh, that's funny. I was just thinking of that. It's either that or Step Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I, 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 anyway. Note, note to anyone listening, I'm not beating up anybody's children. No, but he could if he has to. <laughs> I mean, probably two or even maybe three of them at a time. Pat, please, please save me. <laughs> oh, you Send your eight-year-olds, too. You your whole on that <laughs> All right. Well, what I liked about this, and I'm going to give it, like John said, to the writing, is the opening of this. Them playing around in this you know, train yard, train track area really brought me back to me as a kid uh, in the town I live in. There is a train, the Sioux Line, it's called, uh, kind of flows through here in the, an area where trains, you know, they derail, or not say derail, but they, you know, they switch to trains, move into different stuff, you know. Gotcha. All this area that we would go and play around uh, as kids. And just also, too, just the Space Wars games that they were playing and, and just having some fun as kids with the kids in the neighborhood and, you know, my friends just playing around as kids and just, you know, pew, pew, I got you. And they, oh, okay, you got to fall down, pretend you're dead for a while. Or <laughs> just, oh, just all the fun that it brought back that memory to me in reading this. And he did it very well. I mean, I could see myself in this and, and playing it with the kids that I really enjoyed. And as John said, they weren't, he, he characterized them very good, that it makes sense of what they were doing and what part they are. Mm -hmm. in this story and why blaster would want to help them to help kind of redeem himself. Nice. Nice. So while cats in the cradle is playing Maggie, do you, do you <laughs> have any thing to add to this discussion? Yeah. I, this is the first time in a long time, if ever that I haven't wanted to just smack the children characters in a thing, because usually they are super irritating. Uh, and these kids are actually likable. I even liked their stupid little kid fights about, you know, you're just mad because you're losing. Yeah, I'm not R2. You yeah. know, like, that's what kids do. That's how they fight. And like the one kid having to watch over his little sister because it was either that or he had to stay home and babysit her. So she had to come along to play. And I, I liked the kids a lot. And I liked how they interacted with Blaster 
like when Blaster is saying, you know, he finally opens up and becomes himself and not a little tape deck. Uh, he's very nice to them. He's so sweet. And he promises not to hurt the teddy bear, which is just adorable. Because that was, of course, Robin's <laughs> concern was that Daisy not be hurt. Uh, so, yeah, I, I liked what the kids added to this story. Yeah. Can I just add on to that quick? Really shows that Blaster has done more than any other character, Bumblebee included, I would say, of really observing humans and learning what they're all about to the extent that he knows that there are little humans, he knows that those are called children, and he knows that children are the kinds of little humans who get into trouble. And when, and he recognizes them as needing protection. He stands up to freaking Bruticus and hatches a plan and does so and all to do so. It's almost as if they're trying to really prep up the idea that he would be a good leader of the Autobots. He has these admirable qualities that you I was thinking that, that too, yeah. And well, uh, to, to all of you, I kind of don't appreciate you taking away some of the things that I was going to say as the host of the show. And <laughs> well, I hope that's that when you leave your notes lying around. <laughs> we're going to steal <laughs> your notes. <laughs> I hope you suitably feel ashamed of yourselves for taking that from me. Maggie, you're about to add something? Oh, I was just going to say something stupid. I was just going to say. <laughs> That they should have, like, sent out little vote for blaster buttons, like little pins that they used to do for <laughs> presidential candidates. So I that like, is, like, cross that is blaster. Blaster, yeah. <laughs> that is interesting, though, right? Like, Grimlock got a battlefield promotion, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. they were kind of lost. They did not know what they were going to do without Optimus Prime. They had just sent them off into space, and then Trypticon attacks them with all those scramblers, and everyone is like, oh, I don't know what to do. And Grimlock was like, ah, I do. And when it seemed like he was the strongest and mightiest of them all, like he says that he is all the time. Well, it turns out that being the strongest and the mightiest doesn't necessarily mean that you're the best leader because in the times that we have seen him being a leader, like every time he comes across as a bumbling buffoon. Meanwhile, we have Blaster, who has been doing some solo adventure stuff, but pretty much if we take Blaster from when we met him all the way back in, what was that, Transformers 17? 17. So a couple of years ago almost, where now Blaster then was really almost like Maverick-y and had like that hair trigger temper kind of, and he always wanted to leap into action and Decepticons must die over all things. And now he finds himself in this new alien environment. And what has he done? He's adapted. And he has shown humanity to the humans who are the citizens of this planet that he finds himself on. And he finds himself helping out Autobots. And he finds himself being quick on his feet, figuring everything out. So it would seem that maybe Blaster is a really good leader and maybe he should be the one leading what do you think about that pat i think you're right uh as when you mentioned that in reading this through john had said you know every kind of characteristic that blaster was portrayed here was him being a leader even to the point to where he's like yeah you guys you're right you got me Pro from the protective bots you know you're gonna bring me in i'm fine i'm gonna i did wrong i'm gonna you know Go ahead and go in eat without any uh, fight or whatever. I'm going to just mm -hmm. get what what you're going to do to me or it comes to me and all that. Little does he know what Grimlock's going to do to him. But yeah, no, kidding. no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. But then then you have the opposite with, with Grimlock in here. This man, I kind of like, it's kind of fun because it's like, man, this guy is crazy. I, I think of what I, I'm like, I'm, the more I read this, I'm thinking to myself right now, I'm like, man, I would like a shirt. It's got like a circle with Grimlock on it and it's just Grimlock face like that and it says, Grimlock, me cray cray. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a I fun shirt to have. <laughs> you would have to have one. Crazy gray. You'd it's have crazy. to have one. It'd have to be from this era with him with the crown on his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. With this guy crown. is just crazy. And, and he, well, I got to give it to him, though, because he got the arc. It's flying now. The it's arc like, is wow. flying now. What that are they going to the, do with this thing? What are they going to do with this thing, Pat? I, mean, I don't know. Besides don't just either. chase somebody down because you got to. I'm, I'm, he's going <laughs> to chase children through space, apparently. 
That's what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah, you've got to think that's an enormous expenditure of energy. But let's yeah. see. We can start back around another, another round of discussion with John. John, what do you have? Well, just to kind of keep it where it was going a little bit and going back to what Delvin was saying, you know, with uh, Grimlock as a battlefield promotion, I was thinking about that today, you know, in terms of this issue. And it was like the Autobots that immediately, you know, pretty much unanimously just chose him as leader. They were all grieving because Optimus Prime had just died and they were at the bottom of, of you know, their absolute emotional bottom. So they had been losing a lot and everything looked terrible. And this was the first great good thing that had happened to him for a while. And Grimlock shows up out of nowhere and beats the nastiest Decepticon they'd ever seen. And they go, yay, Grimlock, you're our leader. And Grimlock at that point appeared to have learned some things during that, but then immediately has forgotten them and went to fitting himself for crowns. And now he wants to build a giant device to torture Blaster with so that's going to be interesting yeah like i mean dictators have accomplished great things throughout history but you know at what expense and have they really well i mean yeah great wall of china oh i guess as an example and the pyramids so i have a question you know what i mean i have a question then and we can pass it around was slash is grimlock a good leader and just mentioning and piggybacking off of what Maggie just said, Optimus Prime didn't get the arc prepared to fly off. I mean, yes, maybe in issue 24, he had a little bit of a hitch in his giddy up of getting blown the heck up. I do understand <laughs> that. But from issue one to issue 24, Optimus Prime had not gotten any repairs done on the arc, not really. And it didn't look like they were heading anywhere from planet Earth anytime soon. And since then, 11 issues later, really nine, because we did Man of Iron series in nine issues, not quite a year. And actually, Grimlock took over in what? Issue 27. So what's that? Six issues in about half a year. Grimlock has the arc fully repaired and space worthy. So. With all of that backdrop, is Grimlock a good leader? Pat, I'll start with you again. Hmm, that is an interesting way to look at it. I, I know. Would, I, made, yeah. I, I made it like that intentionally. I know. I would That's, say, is he a good leader when the chips are down and someone needs to step up? Yes. If you're looking for someone to actually lead with compassion and uh, being able to understand all things and all sides, then no. Okay. John, what do you think? Uh, absolutely not. Optimus's goal never was to leave the planet until the Decepticons were taken care of, which Grimlock is showing no um, concern for whatsoever and is leaving the planet with the Decepticons behind and, frankly, you know, would continue to do so because he is completely unconcerned by the, by, the plan- by the members of the planet they're supposed to be protecting. So he's either unilaterally dis- deciding to completely change the purpose of their faction, and the others are kind of swept up in the situation and forced to do so. But he's having them get things done, which was to, you know to finish the repairs on the Ark and to create some sort of giant torture device. I think there's a, probably if if they're able to use, um, harness that much energy and use it to build some gizmos, they probably could. Um, do it a little more efficiently than figuring out creative ways to torture each other and laugh about it. What do you think, Maggie? Is Grimlock a good leader? Yeah, no, I would never support a leader that would condone uh, torturing one of his own people as punishment for, well, I mean, he sees it as like, you know, a a betrayal. Like he went against his orders and and I, I get that, but it's a disproportionate reaction. And he's not, He's not thoughtful. He he doesn't rule with any kind of compassion. He, uh, yeah, no, no, I don't think Grimlock's a good leader at all, hmm. which is really unfortunate because in the cartoon, I loved Grimlock. <laughs> and in this, he's just kind of a jerk. It makes me sad, but stupid crown. Interesting discussion. We have some other things in the book to talk about, at least. We, we have already mm-hmm. talked about the big reveal at the end with the arc, which I thought was really cool. Uh, personally, yeah. uh, but we yeah. didn't talk about the big old robot fight. That was going to be 
There is a big old robot fight. There is, there is, there is a big old, old robot fight, and that's worth talking about, right? So, John, we can start back with you. You got any thoughts on that big old robot fight? I love the big old robot fight. Mm-hmm. I love every panel of it. It's probably the best Gestalt Combiner fight we've seen. The one with Menasaur and Superion in 22 was pretty cool on its own, but with the things they were throwing around. But this one is great. Plus, Bruticus straight up wins. The fight between the two of them. I mean, the hell, you, no, the hell you say? Yeah, he, I know. He, he won. He actually yes. won. There's. A, have you ever seen him win anything at all in the cartoon? No, never. He beat Devis. He he talks a good game, but yeah, there's no trickery. There's no defensor was you know was distracted by defending a human. Nope. Def- Bruticus just beats him. And as a fan of Bruticus, I got to like that. <laughs> it was impressive to see that it looked like Defensor was on the defense for the entire time. He got a little bit of attack in, but just couldn't get a beat on him. And next thing you know, whap, <laughs> got smacked with a, <laughs> with a, with a whole train. Uh, Pat, what did you think about the battle? I thought it was really cool as well, too. I think that was a good opposite to the character stuff that was going on and you know you felt for the kids and you started feeling for blaster then you had the action side of it and it paid off to see that battle that's going on between the two of them artwork was very well done you could definitely understand what was happening in this i liked it very cool and the outcome where blaster takes him out with Mm -hmm. just shocking him Mm-hmm. was really cool and the and the fake out once i saw the kids step up i was like oh okay i know what he's gonna do here. <laughs> but i thought it, it made perfect sense it was perfect of what he did nice nice maggie what do you think yeah i liked the fight and i i liked the role that the kids got to play in it they did a great job selling it um blaster was just flipping awesome it, it makes you really like him not just because he wins uh but because you know before that he defends the kids and protects them and, and saves them from being squashed. Uh, and then comes up with this plan, even though his gun is apparently out of lasers now, um, you know, and, and manages to, to fake out Bruticus and, and win the day. I thought it was great. I loved it. And I was able to follow the action, which is something that I sometimes have trouble doing with the Transformers, especially if the coloring's a little wonky. I kind of lose track of who's who. But it, luckily, it was just two really big ones, so it wasn't too difficult to keep track of. Uh, yeah, I, I liked the fight. I thought it was great. Yeah, I thought it was cool, too, especially because in issue 32, I don't think they combined. Uh, you had the Combaticons fighting against the Protector Bots, but I do not think they combined to their just thought. So this time, they're like, oh, heck no, we're getting immediately at it right away. It's just big robot against big robot. But what I did like about it is it's simple math, really. It looks like, if you think about it, you got the Combaticons on one side and you got the uh, Protector Bots on the other side, and that's pretty much a stalemate, five on five. And Mm -hmm. both times when Blaster jumped into action, that swung the battle. It happened both times. Right. And that's simple math. It's like, okay, yep, now it's six against five. And since we got six and you got five, we're going to win this one. And it happened that way both times. Different different executions, different battles, different even battlefields, but same result. So I was a big fan of it. I want to say something. Maggie mentioned that with Blaster, you know, the, the change in him that happened in this one. Going into this, my thought on Blaster was like, this guy is kind of arrogant and just kind of, you know, I wasn't really feeling for him of what happened over the last few issues, you know, the way he was treating Goldbug and just all that was going on like that. Mm -hmm. This one really, he turned around for me and I I start feeling for him like, okay, this this dude gets it now. I like that. It definitely seems like he's getting it. And I did think he had a reason to be mad at Goldbug and that he thought Goldbug was abandoning him. But I do get what you're saying. Um, that was a little bit more of the hot temper blaster, and this blaster was not hot tempered. He was pretty yeah. much as cool as a cucumber the entire time. So that's cool. Now's the time for us to talk about who had the touch. 
where we talk about which character in the book stood out the most, be it Autobot, Decepticon, or Human. John, who had the touch to you? Uh, I'm going to give the touch to all of the kids. Each, oh, good choice. They were pretty slick, and they were out of all of the humans we've ever been introduced to this side of Buster. Um, they are the ones that I immediately uh, met and liked and was invested in them. A lot of the other ones were okay, but various degrees of, but some I either liked or didn't. Oh, Lord, I like these o? kids. O is my favorite, and I miss o? him I remember every o. day. Oh, okay. yeah. Every day, yeah. I hope he comes back. <laughs> I think he's going to be come back as a headmaster. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> headmaster. Oh, no. I mean, they're, they're resourceful and brave and they're, they all step up when they need to. One kid, it was it, I don't know what Sammy, you know, going out there to stand up, up there and like managing to, you know, pull off the fake falling over. Lucky that, that Bruticus decided, well, prove it, Bla uh, Blaster, shoot one of those. So I know you're a bad guy rather than, oh, you're a bad guy? Well, you won't care if I kill these kids then. <laughs> so, yeah, but it all worked <laughs> out. So the kids, uh, you get the touch. Pat, who do you think had the touch? I'm going to go with Blaster on this one just because his change in attitude and the protecting the kids along with figuring out how to kind of take down Bruticus. Nice. Maggie, who had the touch? I'm going to give the touch to Daisy. And I would like to call everyone's attention to, well, it's page two for me. At the very, very beginning, there's a series of three panels. They're, they're vertical to one another. There's one with Robin holding her and for Daisy. And for some reason, Daisy's missing the lower half of her body in that panel. Daisy is the uh, the, bear. Te the teddy bear. The for teddy bear, yes. And she's kind of like looking out at the audience. In the panel directly below that, she her <laughs> eyes are drawn to like almost be looking at Robin's face. And then in the panel directly below that, she's looking at the gun <laughs> that Robin is holding. Very much like, I don't know if we should be playing with that girl kind of a thing. So I think this is actually like the untold adventure of Daisy the teddy bear. Because the way that her eyes are drawn, she's at least somewhat sentient. <laughs> <laughs> and she has this magnificent adventure. At one point, she gets a little scared at the beginning, but then she really pulled it together, and she got to go on a trip in space. So I'm going to give Ma it to Daisy the teddy bear. Teddy Ruxpin couldn't claim that. There you go. He was on an Ma airship. Ma Ma teddy teddy bear. Maggie, is it possible you could give us that voice again for Daisy? I don't know if you should be playing with that. Is that what I did? <laughs> I probably. I don't know. If I'm actually, really shouldn't play with guns. I don't like that. <laughs> I, I am personally amused. I think the, other, the, the lads are amused too. So thank you. Thank you for that, for, for that voiceover acting. Hollywood, yeah. if you're listening, we have a voice actress in Maggie Schaefer Haynes. And <laughs> me, for I'll give Alan. Alan was the kid who, while Sammy and Jed were arguing uh, again, mm -hmm. Alan said, you know what? Y'all are like, y'all are messing around. I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust the robot here. Maybe that wasn't the smartest thing to do, but it turned out to be a pretty okay decision because Blaster is the one that not only saved the day, but he saved them as well and got them on a space ride. So that was cool. Alan had the touch to me. And if we talked about who had the touch, and someone had to be out of touch, we talk about the character that was the worst in the book, and they should have a device strapped to them that allows them to do nothing in a segment called Less Than Meets the Eye. Pat, who was Less Than Meets the Eye? Well, I got to go with my man Grimlock in this one, <laughs> just because he's the worst. He's like, dude, you're building this machine to torture this guy, and then now you're going to make everybody make the ship so you can go get him because he's not coming to you. <laughs> yeah. It just, oh, again, Grimlock, cray cray. Grimlock is cray cray. It's, it's hard to argue his crayness. Um, Maggie, who was less than meets the eye to you? Yeah, I'm going to give it to Grimlock too. I agree with Pat. Uh, he built an entire device just to torture one dude. Uh, and he just, yeah, no, not not a big fan of where Grimlock's at right now. So definitely less than meets the eye goes to, to the dinosaur. Welcome to the Grimlock cray cray club. Yep. I want that T-shirt. We meet after school. <laughs> <laughs> you fight Tripticon. Yeah. Ooh, cool. John, who's less than me? See, I to you. 
As much as I enjoy the Grimlock Cray Cray Club, I don't think I'm cool enough to be a member yet. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go with Blast Off because out of all of the Decepticons, this guy has the worst day. I mean, here he is cruising 80 miles up, you know, having a good day, has to get called down there, arrives just in time to become Bruticus's foot for a little while, <laughs> then gets electrocuted. <laughs> and then the next thing that happens is that he gets a little um, inhibitor put on him and then has to fly up into space with a bunch of kids in him. Yeah, let's just take a moment to point out how very strange it is that the children's reward is to go to space in the body of one of their enemies. Yeah, it's like it's a little it just strange. seems like so many things could go wrong even before the incredible coincidence of Grimlock picking that moment to fly into space also. But they do have seatbelts. That's true. So. Which they take off once they're in space. Well, so they can fly around. Fly yeah. around. There's no point in going but to space. Like, it's like, like okay, well, can we go and fly to the moon? Nope, just two orbits, kids, then back to bedtime. Yeah, I think you said like once around the yeah, earth. Exactly. <laughs> I did just have a thought, though. They A very sneaky little plot device that they put in is that they were able to track Blaster's whereabouts with that doohickey. With that same doohickey, they could see that Blastoff was in space, or though presumably Blaster somehow was in space. They just followed it. It makes sense. Oh, Grimlock's right. pretty yeah. driven at this point. I forgot. Wheeljack said that they could follow it up to 50... Up to 50... Thousand miles, I think he that's, said. That's that's enough to cover orbit. That's that's a lot of miles. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. that's and I remember at the time thinking like, well, one, that's a wildly effective device, but two, it's like, why would you need to track him fifty thousand miles away? How could he possibly get fifty thousand miles? Oh, well, there you go. He why is, didn't they have that much poorly. trouble finding him before? If the oh well, oh, that was another thing I wanted to say quick. Why were the protector bots? In the railway yard in the first place. I know they were going back to the Ark, but what are they doing here? Are they lost? Look, the freeways at the time were different, and sometimes they <laughs> would go through railway. I don't know, man. <laughs> no, the- it was like they, they were using like early old school Cybertronian map quest, yeah, and it was just... Straight as line, just as screwed up as early map quest was. You know what? Now that now that you mention that, yeah, man, how did anyone get anywhere? I, <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I can't get anywhere without putting on waves. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm the host. I'm getting us distracted. Uh, my less than me, CI. I actually, I I was sitting there going through my head, and I'm, I'm just gonna default. I didn't have anyone picked out immediately. I can't pick on Bruticus and the Combaticons because. I think that they were outfoxed in a decent way. Blaster yeah. got them pretty good. So that was just a good outfoxing. So I think either Grim, like either one of your choices is good. Grimlock is, is um, a very good choice because he didn't exhibit all of the greatest leadership uh, characteristics, even though he has the arc up and coming, which made me ask the question I did. But I think Blastoff had a slightly worse day because – He's sitting around like he's sitting around kind of like Blaster was. Like, if we could get Blast off stalls, he's probably like, Ain't this a home? I want to read that. (laughs) Blastoff's worst day. Yeah, I would love to hear Blast off stalls. They probably are not very, um, very PG. Definitely a PG 13 (laughs) uh, audience there. All right, everybody, we have talked about more than meets the eye, less than meets the eye. We've talked about the book, so we should talk about some ratings. One to ten, everybody, and what the heck, I will go first. I was at about a seven on this book, but to me, the arc reveal was a really big one. Like when you see the arc cruising through space and everything, and because even when they mention, hey, once we get enough cubes to energize the art then we're going to be off and going you didn't know how long that was going to take that could have been a five six issue arc in itself or something happened with them their ability to generate powers like nope they were up and at them now and that was a huge reveal for me and that bumped it up from a seven for me to an eight uh let's go to john john what would you rate transformers 35 i'm going to give this an eight as well um this is a very solid issue this um the art is fall- firing on all cylinders the story is great it just it really feels like you know like some of the other ones which i you know qualified as filler i guess even though it was the wrong term but 
the earlier ones in this arc that were just like one mm -hmm. shot. I mean, even the one previous to this, it just kind of felt to me like it was going through motions. This one had a shot of energy in it that that really brought me back into the story. And I'm really excited to see what, what's happening next, especially since I remember uh, what happens next is Skylinks. So I'm going to give this one an eight. This was great stuff. Nice. So we have the most experienced people. Let's go to the slightly less experienced. We'll start with Pat. Pat, what would you rate Transformers 35? I made an eight as well, too, on this one. I really like the character moments in this. The good storytelling with Blaster and the kids had me pulled in and made me think about, you know, those thoughts that I memories of a kid that I had. Mm -hmm. And I like the action in this one. As you mentioned, Delvin, it was a great action between the two combiners, uh, very equal fights between the two that, you know, one was would do something, the other one would counter it. And it, it was just a good battle between the two, I thought was very interesting. So I'm giving it an eight. Glad you enjoyed it. Let's end with Maggie. I think I'll join the the eight party. I think that sounds like a very fair rating to give this. I also, I enjoyed the the characters in the story. I liked the fight. I liked the cover. The arc reveal was very cool. Um, I particularly liked Blaster in this one. So I, I feel eight is a, is a very reasonable score to give this issue. Eight is enough, Mackie. You had it right there. It was teed up. I'm like, is she going to say it? Is she going to say it? Eight is enough? She, she's, oh. she doesn't, she's a little younger. Oh, I know no. one is the loneliest number, but is eight enough? Um, oh. Before Nick at Night showed you Cheers, before that, there's a period when it showed a whole bunch of black and white TV shows up to, up to the seen. earlier ages between that. So you'd have oh, shows like Eight is enough, enough, which was... Oh, that's involved. a show. Yes. It's about... It's about who was that? That was a Van Patten? Dick Van Patten, yes. Dick Van Patten and his eight children. And Maggie. Who's you, Dick Van Patten? Maggie, you are hurting my feelings right now. You're just, I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> I'm usually very good at this kind of thing, but I don't know what eight is enough uh, is. You know I'm what? Google it now, though. While, while I go to wipe my tears, <laughs> we can and never will leave you without John's segment of the show called Transformers Spotlight where he discusses a particular Transformer that was featured in today's issue. It's all yours, John, while I fetch some tissue. Maggie knows plenty about old TV. We did name our dog Rhoda. Anyway, we are going to do Bruticus today. At least I wanted to do Bruticus, but when I went to look it up, um, it said Bruticus never actually had um, a tech specs released in America because they never made a gift set for Bruticus like they did in... You know, like for uh, Superior and Menasaur, forever, I guess they didn't sell as well, and so they didn't make this. But I found out, thanks to Anthony at TFU.info, Transformers University, pointed out that they did have a release in Japan, and that one had tech specs, which uh, he had translated on his website. So that's what we have here, which is just Brut Bruticus transforms into the five Combaticons, can destroy his en enemies with ultrasonic waves and smash metal bridges with a single chop of his hand. Cold-blooded, likes nothing more than destroying Autobots. Once he starts running wild, he is unstoppable. He has small brain circuits, making him simple-minded, carries a sonic stun gun and a missile cannon. His strength is 10, his intelligence is 3, his speed is 1, his endurance is 9, his rank is 5. His courage is 10, his firepower is 8, and his skill is 6. And he is made up of the five Combaticons, Blastoff, Brawl, Onslaught, Vortex, and Swindle. And what we've seen up to here is about the extent of Bruticus that we're going to get in the comics. He'll make some appearances, but not really to do all that much. Um, it is notable, it is never quite explained where either the where Bruticus or the Combaticons or Protective Bots came from. They just kind of show up in issue 24 with no explanation. Uh, but we finally get to see their Gestalt's throwdown in this issue. And Bruticus handles himself way better than he usually does in the cartoon, uh, where he was created by Starscream from abandoned World War II vehicles uh, he found on an island he'd been stranded on, you know, blast off being made from one of the famous World War II space shuttles. Um, anyway, he in that one he gets manhandled by Menasaur, and, that, and then in a later episode gets almost completely destroyed from one shot from Defensor, 
So, but I always thought he looked super cool, so it was kind of fun for me to see him win in a in an even fight in this one. And that is Bruticus. Yeah, I don't know what history you saw, John, but I mean, I saw plenty of space shuttles fly in World War II. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, the the famous battle of um, well, <laughs> I. Space, war. uh, space, space wars. wars. Yes. Phew, phew, phew. 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 Space wars of World War II. It in was which a the Nazis reenactment. Are, uh, on the moon. Right. That's moon. right. We will go to a promo break. The Transformers will return after these messages. I'm Mike Gillis. And I'm Casey Doran. And we want to ask you an important question. Are you sick and tired of other panel discussion shows wasting your time droning on and on about foreign policy, economics, and human rights? Or do you want to hear conversations about things that actually matter? We host a podcast called Radio vs. the Martians. Every month we gather a panel of our nation's finest minds and plunge a rusty prison shank into the heart of tough questions that have an impact on the lives of real people like you. Like, are drivers required to pull over for the Ghostbusters? Is the United Federation of Planets actually an oppressive dictatorship run by guidance counselors? Is Arnold Schwarzenegger secretly a genius? And are we being mean when we laugh at movies that are so bad they're good? So write your congressman and let them know that Radio vs. the Martians is available on iTunes, Stitcher, and on RadioVsTheMartians.com. We now return to the Transformers. Now it's time for transmissions, where we heap praise upon the audience for listening to us. And, well, there's an issue, y'all. Sorry. Uh, there are some Facebook post things that happened and some some science and some some enzymes and they're coagulating and stuff. And so, yeah, we don't have them. We lost them, unfortunately. And really sad about that. I really do enjoy reading the comments and the likes and the shares from everybody. But... All I can say, and I could think I speak for all of us, is just thank you so much for all of your support. It's It's been immense, and we are extraordinarily grateful for that. We will get back to sharing everyone's names for the latest episode soon, hopefully with either 33 or 34, but we will be getting back to the comments very soon, and hopefully we don't have any more snap ooze. And that is the show. Please come back and join us for the next episode where we discuss Transformers issue 36, where this blasted Grimlock thing does not seem to be going away anytime soon. And now there are kids involved and Skylinks. So if you'd like to hear more from us, the Long Boss Crusade is in a lot of places. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and most podcatchers to include Spotify at www.longboxcrusade.com. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, all of them. You look for Long Boss Crusade, you will find us. You can join us at Patreon for $1 a month. YouTube, please subscribe. We have a do it live stream once a month, every second Sunday. We have Come Out to Play, a New Warriors podcast that I host. We have Jared dropping in, doing artwork and stuff all the time. He has a reminisce podcast about all different stuff from his childhood and just all sorts of cool content on YouTube Please subscribe. We're looking to grow our membership there as well. There's even a voicemail, 707-532-5269. That is 707-532-LBOX. I hear Pat coming off a of mute to sing. Pick up the phone. Excellent, Pat. You can also email us at contact at longboxcrusade.com. And John and Mackie, why don't you tell us about your podcast and where you can be found on the internet? Uh, you can check out the Rod Pod for more Transformers talk. That's where Maggie and I, along with John M. Wilson, cover the IDW Phase 2 Transformers comics in order. You can also catch Married Watching Cartoons, Married with Comics, and as well as all of our other MWC podcasts. The best way to find us is to point your podcaster to either Married with Comics or MWC Podcasts, which is any of the podcast places, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on all Audible, and you can also ask your Amazon device to play MWC podcasts, and it'll play us. You said we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Though. It is true. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure it sounds okay. Sorry. Anyways. Um, you can catch me on Twitter at MWC underscore podcast, and I am at Maggie and the Rain. And Pat, where can you be found? Well, John, I am glad you 
ass. You can find me on the Twitter at Christatos01. Delvin? You can find me on Twitter at D-E-E underscore R-A-Y 1977. Excellent show, Maggie, John, and Pat. Thank you so much for being here. See everyone next time. And remember, freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Till all are one. Till all, Til all are one. one. You got the touch. You got, you got the power. power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. Days in. Puts out a test, but it's never enough. You got the touch. You got the power. Battle hell's breaking loose, you'll be right in the eye of the storm.